it's wonderful to be back. Um, let me see if I can get my slides. Ah, there we go. So, following on from where Marcus started or finished, um, the topic of the Congress set the title of my talk because consciousness and the information field, there is a connection between your brain and what we do with frequencies and this realm of consciousness, no matter how you think of it. So we should define it for this talk. Integrated consciousness and the information field is the title of the Congress, but what do we think those words mean? There's the physics of it, and there's the spirituality of it, and there's the psychology of it, but more important, what does it mean to you? What do we think those words mean? We have to set a definition for my lecture. So for the purposes of this lecture, I mean that the information field is an enormous universal body of information that is available to each one of us through our connection to the collective unconscious, that is a phrase from Jung, or what we now call integrative consciousness. How does this work though? How can a universal field hold information that is available to our consciousness? I don't have the physics that Marcus has. So for me, it's simpler. We believe that the universal electromagnetic field, if you look at string theory, the universe is a huge net that is like a large electromagnetic field and it has the ability to store information in the same way that your computers store information on magnetic tape. Do you remember the big computers with magnetic tape? Huh? They stored information on these magnetic tapes. Jung says, all information ever discovered and any emotion ever felt by anyone would be stored in this field. And because we are in this field, we can access it. Hello? So how does your magnetic field work? You know that you have a magnetic field, correct? All right, I turned that off. Um, your body is filled with chemicals and every chemical has electrons. Every moving electron creates a magnetic field and your body is full of moving electrons. So your body has a magnetic field. Every organ in the body contributes to that field, especially the brain and the heart. There are, on magnetic analysis, there are magnetic fields specific to the heart and the brain that can be seen and measured. And that's more or less what they look like. This is, that's a picture. That's, this isn't, that's a drawing. But this is a representation of what your magnetic field looks like. So the Earth's magnetic field and the universal magnetic field meet and interact. One of the characteristics of magnetic fields is that they do not stop. They have no edges. Your magnetic field from your body it gets thinner and thinner as it gets farther away, but it goes around the planet and comes back into the other side of your body. It goes out into space and there is no edge. You are connected to all reality very, very physically. Magnetic fields, so those fields merge, con connect, merge, and interact. Now magnetic fields from the entire universe reach and interact with the Earth's field. And your personal 
So there's the universe. The, here's the earth. The universal magnetic field impacts the earth. The earth's magnetic field looks like this. And that interacts with your personal magnetic field. So not only are you connected to the magnetic field of the earth, where all the earth's information is stored. You have to think about the magnetic field as a big computer chip, a storage device where information is stored. So the Earth's magnetic field contains information and the universal magnetic field contains information and you're all connected to, to this field and to each other and to the universal field. So, I'm very practical. How do we access and sort that information? I propose that we access all universal information stored in the information field when our own electromagnetic field downloads it into the processing center we call the brain, the nervous system, and our endocrine system. That download creates our experience of reality. So your brain and your body create your perception and experience of reality and consciousness. So the brain processes and integrates information in the frontal cortex. So my brain sees shapes and colors, bits of white, that I am educated from childhood to know that these shapes and colors are people. They are humans like me. There are in this group no snakes, no gorillas, no elephants, no birds, right? So it is my frontal cortex that knows this. Information processing is modified by connections from the, mid, from the cortex, from the front, to the midbrain and the medulla, where the stress centers are in the brain. So in one sense, this talk is going to look at how the stress centers in your brain interfere with your ability to process, see, integrate, and receive all of the information that's in the universe, all of the information that is available to you. How do these stress centers interfere with that ability? And then there's the endocrine system, the hormones in your body that do almost everything. And emotions, we think of psychology as emotions. Hmm. What are emotions? Have you ever thought about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm afraid, I'm anxious, I'm happy. Yeah, what is that? Yeah? They are created by interactions, honestly, and I'm a psychologist as well as a physician, so they are created by interactions between the brain and the endocrine system. So there are neurotransmitters that make you feel happy. There are neurotransmitters from the brain and the endocrine system that make you feel afraid. There are neurotransmitters and hormones that, that allow you to feel or to cr that create what we think of as the various emotions that we feel, such as grief and anger and fear and joy. There are physical correlates, physical events in your body that correspond to those emotions. So, the short version is that your brain and your body, your endocrine system, your nervous system, determine how you connect with the information field. Marcus has clearly established how the information field exists, what it looks like, 
how the physicists um, describe it. So we have as a given that there is an information field. How do you connect with it? Our human experience of reality and consciousness depend almost entirely on our connection to the universal field and on the function of the brain, the body, and the endocrine system and the interactions between the information field, the brain, the stress centers, the endocrine system, and our emotions create our experience of reality and consciousness. So there are two different pieces of this. One is the concept that there is a reality that exists outside of our perception. That is a conversation that's too big for today. So we start with there is a reality that is outside of our consciousness, right? That, that exists up, out there, independent of me. And then there is the concept that I am part of that reality and I interact with it. From there we move to how I interact with it. And because what I do is called frequency specific microcurrent, the next piece of this conversation that we're having is how do we use, those of you that have taken um, the McMakin course, how do we use specific frequencies to affect the brain, the stress centers, and emotions? If the brain, the stress centers, and emotions regulate or control your experience of and your access to the information field and consciousness, then specific frequencies can modify the brain and body to reduce stress and enhance your experience of and your access to the information field. Let's talk about how we do that. So the frequencies are a new tool that you probably didn't know you needed that does something you probably didn't think was possible, right? We have an idea that the only way to access and open ourselves to the information field is by meditation and fasting and being a vegetarian and not fighting with people and relaxing and smiling and breathing deeply and all of those things. But what if you had a tool that made all of that easier? That is my job. What would happen to your body and the clarity of your access to the information field if you could reduce inflammation, reduce stress, and what we call sensory sensitization, activate the vagus nerve, and I'm going to teach you more than you probably wanted to know about the vagus nerve, inactivate viruses, balance autonomic function, sympathetic and parasympathetic stress centers, and increase body energy production by 500% quickly uh, without drugs and there was a reasonable mechanism of action and some sort of actual data that says we can do that. This is not theory, this is real stuff that happens in real bodies in real time done by people besides me. So it is not only doable, it is reproducible. It's called frequency specific microcurrent and it has been doing that for 22 years now with frequencies and with microcurrent. So let's look at what, um, what we're dealing with that creates stress in the body. Inflammation is the thing we are all the most familiar with, yes? Inflammation produces Threat is perceived by the body as threat and it creates a stress, stress response. So the ideal anti-inflammatory would reduce lipoxygenase and cyclooxygenase inflammation quickly, uh, dramatically, temporarily because you actually need inflammation in order to survive but then the inflammation has to stop in the normal range, which is what keeps your body normal. And it would be nice if it was inexpensive, 
non-invasive, uh, easily available, and approved as a medical intervention. That would be good, right? Uh, so, uh, we did that. There is that. There are specific frequencies. In this experiment, it was 40 hertz on channel A and 116 hertz on channel B, the frequency that we think of as being for the immune system. So um, this was what they call blinded animal research. And that does not mean that you're working on animals that are blind, you know, and walk around with canes. No, no blind mice. It is the, re oh, come on. <laughs> I keep forgetting about the translators. So um, there were mice, and the researchers who were doing the work um, were all in separate rooms with the doors closed. So they couldn't tell who was doing what with the mice. They would paint on the mouse's ears a substance called arachidonic acid that makes the ears swell. and then in a mouse that you don't do anything to, this is how much swelling is caused when you paint arachidonic acid on the mouse's ears. If you run 40 hertz on A and 116 hertz on channel B on a microcurrent machine, and you grab the mouse by the tail and the back of its neck, and you do it for two minutes, then the inflammation is reduced by 50%. And then if you do it for four minutes, the full reduction in inflammation is present, and that reduces the inflammation in the mouse, mouse's ear by swelling by 62%. There, if you use mere steel stearate and you produce cox-mediated inflammation, that produces a 30% reduction in cox-mediated inflammation in every animal in a four-minute time-dependent response. So half the effect is there at two minutes, the full respect effect is there at four minutes. And the results were so good that the chief researcher didn't believe them, and she went in and turned the machine away from the man that was holding the mice, and she put in a placebo frequency, and still these results were what they found. And then they found that only one frequency combination reduced inflammation, no other frequency combination, no matter what it was supposed to be for, and the current by itself did nothing to reduce inflammation. Only 40 hertz on A and 116 hertz on B reduced swelling in the mouse's ear. Nothing else produced any change. That's different. Why is inflammation, why am I even talking about inflammation? Why is inflammation a problem? Well, inflammation interferes with brain function. So your access to the person next to you, to this universal field, comes to you by way of your brain and endocrine system and nervous system. Inflammation interferes with brain function. The ideal anti-inflammatory would reduce TNF-alpha and other inflammatory cytokines dramatically, quickly, temporarily. Inflammation is important to keep you alive. If you do not have TNF-alpha and the other cytokines, you end up dying of infection and cancer. So it's important that if you're going to reduce these inflammation um, peptides, that they are reduced dramatically, quickly, but temporarily. And you want to have them stop in the normal range, and it would be nice if it, the treatment was inexpensive, non-invasive, available, and approved. So we did a study on fibromyalgia patients who had fibromyalgia caused by some sort of spine trauma. There were 54 of them. It was nine and a half years average chronicity with a range of one year to 50 years. And we got blood sample data on a subset of only six patients from the National Institutes of Health in the US. And 28% of fibromyalgia patients 
have fibromyalgia that is associated with spine trauma. In the US alone, that is 2 million patients. In India and China, it is many, many times more than that. And what we found clinically was that only one frequency combination was effective. 40 hertz on channel A and 10 hertz on channel B is the frequency to address the spinal cord. So the hypothesis or the theory is that this inflammation in the spinal cord makes um, full body pain that creates illness, this illness known as fibromyalgia. In this group, they come in with their pain at a 7.4 out of 10. And after the treatment, all of the patients, 100% of them, left with their pain at a 1.3 out of 10 after 90 minutes. And 58% of them recovered from fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is thought to be incurable. But they had FSM in the office, they used a home unit, they had physical therapy, reconditioning, supplements. We still had to treat irritable bowel, their sleep, get them off of medications. But 58% of them recovered from a condition that is thought not to be curable. All patients experience pain relief. Uh, 13 of the 53 discontinued treatment that were not relate for reasons not related to the treatment side effects. Why is that? The average chronicity was what was it, eight years? If you have had your pain at a seven for eight years and in 90 minutes it goes to zero, that group of patients experiences an identity crisis that is unparalleled in medicine. Who are you if your reality somehow changes that quickly? So that's why people drop out. But it was interesting that of all the frequencies we tried, only 40 hertz on channel A and 10 hertz on channel B reduced interleukin-1, which is the cytokine that is associated the most with nervous system inflammation, TNF-alpha, which is the cytokine associated most with autoimmune disease and neural inflammation, interleukin-6. Those of you that know statistics, you know that these p-values, uh, they're a measure of how significant the statistic is, and they're huge. These are, with only six patients, these p-values are huge, incontrovertible. Substance P is what conveys pain in the spinal cord. It was reduced from 180 down to 54. Endorphins go up. They get uh, very floaty, very uh, relaxed, and um, we call it stoned, but I'm not sure if they use that word in Germany. And the pain was reduced from a 7 to a 1. This p-value, for those of you that know statistics, this p-value actually has six zeros. But when you publish a paper, you don't publish any more than three because anything more than three is uh, showing off. So. Now, what's interesting is that in medicine, with all medical applications, all known treatments, inflammatory cytokines are hard to change. And when they change, they change slowly over months. One month to three months is how long it takes it to work. 40 hertz reduced all inflammatory cytokines by 10 to 20 times in 90 minutes. And when they came back at the second treatment, they came back at a much reduced level. How'd that happen? Well, the fact of the matter is that cytokines, this inflammation, is created by changes in cell signaling. So these were all of the cytokines that were measured, and the only thing that makes sense is that only changes in cell signaling could normalize them so quickly. We'll talk about how the cell works, but that's the theory. How do we do this? And then how do we change cell signaling? Receptors, cell signaling works 
receptors on the outside of the cell respond to external factors like bleeding, bacteria, tissue fragments, damps and pamps that change, that activate or change this receptor that changes kinases that are inside the cell, that changes transcription, translation factors inside the cell, and that changes genetic expression, and that changes what the cell does for a living. That changes what the cell excretes. So drugs and nutrients, the natural products even that we are used to, curcumin and turmeric and a vegetable diet, or if you are a medical physician, pharmaceutical drugs, or aspirin, or ibuprofen, or Tylenol. They act like keys in a lock to change that membrane receptor, yeah, like a key in a lock. And that changes the inflammation that's being created by the cell and that changes intracellular function. Well, frequencies act like a key remote, changing the lock with an electromagnetic signal. The frequencies appear to change membrane, protein, and configuration and cell function electromagnetically to normalize the cytokine levels by actually changing that. That's where the frequencies work. Yeah? If you used your key fob, your key remote, to lock your car when you parked it, you are using a frequency-specific signal to change the function of the lock. It is no different with the cell. So how does, what does this have to do with your access to higher consciousness and higher states of self-actualization and your connection to consciousness. Infection, injury, and stress turn on inflammation and turn off access to higher consciousness. When your body is worried about physical safety, infection, threat, hunger, warmth, sleep, it interferes with your access to higher function. This pyramid is from Abraham Maslow. He was a psychologist probably in the 50s and 60s. But this, this model for how we operate is self-evident, right? If you are living out in the woods, if you're being pursued by wild animals or enemies, and you have to try and find food and shelter and stay warm, right? Are you thinking a lot or experiencing prayer and your higher self? Hmm, not so much. So when you repair the injury, reduce the inflammation and quiet the stress centers, access to this higher function returns. And that's what we're going to be talking about. There are two things here. There is this external reality we would call collective consciousness and there is how you integrate experience and react with it. So infection and injury turn on inflammation by changing the cell signaling with pieces of bacteria, blood cells and pieces of tissue that are broken. But when the inflammation, when those signals, blood, bacteria, tissue fragments, appear any place in your body, the vagus nerve takes that information, sends it to the brain and says, oh my goodness, there is a tiger and I'm going, I'm under threat, help. The stress centers in the brain create inflammation by suppressing the vagus nerve. Now, the vagus nerve is what quiets your heart rate. We'll talk about it in a minute. It quiets your heart rate. It stimulates digestion. It um, suppresses inflammation. The vagus has as its function 
to suppress inflammation. But when you have infection and injury, that turns off the vagus. Why? Why does inflammation and stress response stay after the infection is gone and the injury is repaired? Why, why does the vagus get turned off during stress and injury? Why does inflammation go up? A little bit more about the vagus and then we'll go on. The vagus nerve suppresses inflammation naturally when the infection is gone and the injury is healed. If there is no tiger, if you have no wound, if you do not have an infection, you notice that your appetite comes back, right? Your digestion comes back to normal. <sighs> your heart rate goes down from 90 back down to 65, where it usually is. You know when you have a cold or the flu or a fever and your temperature goes up? Your heart rate goes up, right? Then, when the infection is gone, everything goes back to normal. That's all the vagus. You didn't maybe know that before if you're not a physiology geek. But that's all the vagus. It runs everything. And the vagus is a problem because it gets in the way of survival during stress. The vagus slows the heart rate. If you are running away from a tiger in the woods, do you want your heart rate slow? Uh, no. You want to be able to run like crazy. If you're being attacked by a tiger, do you want to digest your food? I don't think so. You can digest your food tomorrow if you live, and if there is a tomorrow, but right now there's this, you know, tiger thing. The vagus suppresses the immune system. Why would you want the immune system suppressed? Why? Well, tiger spit has lots of germs. Ew. And so the immune system has to be very active to fight off the infection. So the vagus suppresses the immune system. The vagus is inhibited by the central stress response so the heart rate can go up, the digestive system can be turned off, and the immune system can be very active, creating inflammation to fight infection and repair tissue, right? So you can survive. The human system is designed to survive. And the vagus is a big part of that. Now, Let's say the tiger goes away, infection is gone, trauma is gone, it's all good, and everything should be fine, right? But every one of you either treat patients or are people where the infection is gone, the trauma is repaired, and sometimes the stress centers stay on and the vagus stays off. Why is that? Why do people stay inflamed? Why do they stay afraid? Why does the, their resting heart rate be a 90? Why is that? Well, in a normal patient, once the infection is gone, the trauma is repaired, the afferent vagus, the vagus that goes from down here to up here, tells the brain that all is well, and it stops sending tiger information. Yo. The tiger is asleep in the driveway. And I think maybe the tiger is d gone in the neighbor's yard. The primitive stress centers in the brain calm down and the vagus should come back on in a normal patient. However, why do the stress centers stay on and why does the vagus stay off? And how can we change that? First you understand the why, and then we'll talk about how we do that. There is a concept that's important for you to know about. It's called central sensitization. This midbrain stress centers, the amygdala, the hippocampus, the thalamus, these midbrain stress centers, um, have their firing threshold, what makes them fire or go off. 
that threshold is set and modified. It is set at conception. Children, there was a study, children that were conceived and implanted with frozen embryos. So when you put sperm and egg together in a dish, you wait until there are 32 cells in a blastocyst and you put that in the freezer and you freeze six of them and then you implant that frozen blastocyst in a woman's uterus and it grows to be an infant, the one that survives, grows to be an infant and then when that blastocyst is a human who is seven years old and you compare that child to a child that was conceived naturally without being frozen at 32 cells, the blood pressure of the child who was conceived by the frozen embryo is significantly higher than the blood pressure of the child conceived normally. They don't even overlap. It's not a small difference they are completely different. Maternal stress during pregnancy lowers the firing threshold. The women that are in stressful marriages or stressful living situations, their stress hormones are higher, and when their children are born and grow up, even if the only stressful time was during pregnancy, when that child grows up, he has a lower firing threshold in the stress centers when the child becomes an adult with less objective threat. There is no objective threat. There's no objective threat. All threat is perceived subjectively by the person. Early childhood trauma, sexual or physical abuse, surgery even, accidents or any trauma prior to the age of seven will lower the firing threshold, activating stress centers when that child is an adult with little objective external threat. And then let's say that the child is conceived normally, has an uneventful childhood, has no early childhood trauma, the mother had an unstressful pregnancy, but as an adult at the age of 14 or 16, that person is raped, or has a significant pain problem, experiences physical abuse, PTSD from war, kidnapping, auto accidents, assault, all of those events will lower the firing threshold for years or permanently. So something that to you is completely benign, no threat whatsoever, it's a horse. The horse is standing right there. He's not doing anything. No threat, right? Not to me. But to someone who was kicked and injured by a horse, that is a threat. Threat is subjective. And what is perceived as a threat will make the brain and the nervous system respond differently. Central sensitization is what we're talking about. You can look it up. The stress centers stay on even when the threat is gone. They are said to be sensitized and they fire with very little objective external stressor or threat. And the reason is that the midbrain remembers. The midbrain remembers. It puts in unconscious, subconscious, or rarely conscious memory, early childhood and past injury, pain and stressful events so you can predict and survive future events. And our problem is that the patient is unlikely to be aware of this sensitization or any of these memories. Visual stimuli, sounds, smells, even textures, furniture configurations, can trigger the midbrain and set off a stress response reaction of no conscious memory of why it's happening or even what is happening. So for example, when I started talking about visual stimuli, sounds, smells, textures, 
furniture arrangements. Was there anybody in the room that got a fleeting memory of something that happened when they were young? Yeah, it's about 20%, 30% of the group. It always happens. The problem is that we have the same response to all stressors. Is it an argument between your parents? Is it the fact that your boss is yelling at you? Is it a tiger? All stress, the stress centers, the endocrine and the nervous system react to all stress in more or less the same way. They suppress the vagus in order to increase the heart rate, suppress digestion, increase inflammation. Why? It's well-intentioned. It's so you can survive. It is how the brain and neuroendocrine system interpret what is threat. And that is influenced by a lot of things. In a sensitized patient, the midbrain stress centers have a different and lower firing threshold. They fire with less objective threat. And the stress centers stay on from normal life stresses and events. To 80% of the people in this room, the sound of a doorknob opening produces no stress response whatsoever. To anybody in this room that was molested as a child, especially a child under the age of 10, the sound of a doorknob clicking will raise raise the heart rate even if the person doesn't remember the event the sound will raise the heart rate interfere with digestion and create inflammation and turn down the vagus that's how powerful this response is so if the vagus if the stress centers stay on from normal life stresses and events and keep the vagus off keeping the body in survival if you're down here at this bottom of the pyramid and you're always feeling threat in your body and in your nervous system, how do you access this universal energy field? Interfering with access to higher states of con consciousness. It is my proposition that the vagus nerve is the key to inflammatory balance, but how do you treat the vagus quickly and safely? You can do breathing and silence and meditation but that takes years. And there are times when the silence itself is a stressful event, if that participated or if that was part of your original trigger. For us, it has become easy. We modify the vagus with frequencies and with microcurrent. So we knew from before that frequencies treat the brain in concussion. So treatment one, we ran the concussion protocol and the patient's EEG went there. Now the patient still had anxiety, so we treated the forebrain and those midbrain stress centers, right? And so the red line is the second treatment after we treated the forebrain and the midbrain. That all quieted down. But the prefrontal cortex is part of that stress response center. It analyzes, sorts, sends out messages about threat. And the green line, the third treatment, is the pre after we added the frequency for the prefrontal cortex. Those changes in EEG took place in someone who had a brain injury two years ago. And this was at the end of the second week of therapy. And that's how his brain changed. Only one set of frequencies raised serotonin. In the fibromyalgia cases, the pain was going down. And at the end of um, uh, an hour, we ran what we call the concussion protocol. All of the McMakin students in the audience know what that is. And the only thing, the only neurotransmitter that changed direction was serotonin. Serotonin is the neurotransmitter that is about flexibility and joy, and ease, and relaxation. That's serotonin. And the concussion protocol alone, it's the only thing, concussion protocol doubled it in 30 minutes. 
Only one frequency increases secretions in specific tissues. This is data on increasing secretions in the ovary. And that big spike right there is from increasing secretions in the ovary by using the frequency to increase secretions in the ovary. No other, none of the other increased secretion frequencies had any effect on estrogen. So then we have to take, because I don't have any data on the vagus. I have lots of experience, but I have no data. So we have to kind of make a thread. If frequencies could connect the brain after a stroke, then it appears possible for frequencies to increase secretions in the vagus. A little bit of information about a stroke. Stroke patients are spastic because they lose secretions from the motor cortex. This was a 38-year-old patient, three years after a stroke, and she had spastic paralysis in the upper right extremity, flaccid paralysis in the lower extremity, right side center, sensory anesthesia. So it was a left-sided stroke that affected the right side of her brain. If you could increase secretions from the left sensory cortex down to the body, you could relax spasticity and improve sensation, right? Well, and we did exactly that. Increasing secretions in the sensory and motor cortex. After 30 minutes, the spasticity in the hand relaxed. After 60 minutes, the arm and shoulder relaxed for passive movement. And after 90 minutes, there was active arm and shoulder movement for the first time in three years. Sensation was normal, and the patient said, this glove is gone. So I didn't expect it to last. Uh, who, right? Who would believe that was possible? But five days later, she still had active range of motion, and so we treated her again. And then instead of the arm just going up like this, it relaxed more of the trunk, and her arm went behind her head. And at five months, the improvement still persisted. Now, this isn't going to be universal when the patient is 78 instead of 38, but in this case, it worked. Frequencies modify your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system with one minute treatment and testing by heart rate variability. So how do we do all that? Frequency specific microcurrent is a new treatment paradigm. It's a different way of thinking about how to treat patients specifically medically. This group is used to using frequencies to influence the information field and the space and the patient. Frequency specific is very specific. And this treatment can reduce inflammation and restore balance in the nervous system. So the history is that frequency specific therapies were developed in the early 1900s, mostly by MDs and osteopaths. They used funky old machines in the US, the UK, and Germany. And they were used by thousands of physicians until 1934. In 1934, the American Medical Association, I'm embarrassed to say, and the pharmaceutical industry forces labeled these treatments as fakes, and any physician who used them um, would lose his license. So the devices went in the back room, all of the research and the history were lost or destroyed, and some of the practitioners were persecuted. So everybody was really clear, if that guy went to jail, I could go to jail, so I'm going to put this machine in the back room and cover it with a sheet and I won't use it. Harry Van Gelder came from England to the US, completely ignorant of this history. He bought a practice in 1946 that, and walked into the practice and there in the back room was a machine, was a, was a thing under a sheet. Hmm. Pulled off the sheet, and there's a machine. Being a Dutchman, he said, I wonder what that machine does. And under the machine was a list of frequencies. Then George Douglas, who was a chiropractic student, went down and worked with Harry Van Gelder in 1983. So the machine is made in 1922. Dr. Van Gelder found it in 1946. Dr. Douglas got the list of frequencies from Dr. Van Gelder in 1983. And put the list in a drawer. You know how that works? You have drawers like that? Yeah. So in 1995, I graduated from chiropractic college 
And Dr. Douglas found the list when he was moving. Oh, there's a list. Oh, there's a microcurrent machine. Yeah, mm, my pointer's not working. So there's a microcurrent machine. So we first started using the list with that two channel, two three digit microcurrent machine. And as a scientist, as a clinician, I had to give up needing to know. I have no idea how the frequencies were derived. I have no idea. There is no way to know because it's been burned. It's lost. It's gone. There is no way to know how some physician in 1920 decided that the frequency that would reduce inflammation was 40 hertz. There's no way to know. There's no way to know how some physician in 19 18 decided that 396 hertz was the frequency that would address the nerve. The 1920s equipment was not microcurrent. So I first started using the frequencies in 1995 to treat muscle and nerve pain. And they were first taught in 97. And the consistent benefits and effects, the most important thing is that they're teachable and reproducible. And then research in animals and humans and clinical results have accumulated over the next 20 years. The clinical response is very frequency specific. Inflammation reduces pain, redness, swelling, doesn't change range of motion, makes viruses worse. Fibrosis and scarring dissolves scar tissue, increases range of motion, doesn't pain, change pain or redness, doesn't change viruses one way or the other. Hemorrhage stops bleeding, stops pain in the menses, prevents bruising after surgery, after fractures, after new injuries, doesn't do anything else. Kidney stone pain is not useful for any other thing except the pain from a kidney stone. Doesn't do anything for the stone, doesn't do anything for viruses, doesn't do anything for inflammation, but if you are passing a kidney stone, it will take the pain away. And that is all clinical. The current itself increases cellular energy by 500%. That's in three studies between 1982 and 2002. So we're pretty clear that the current by itself gives your body for free five times the amount of energy it had before. Now, one of the challenges with reducing inflammation is that it makes infection worse. But using the frequencies for shingles will stop the infection. This was a, a 85 year old man with shingles in the ophthalmic branch of five. And it's only one set of frequency combinations used for four hours on him because he was my husband. I used it for six hours, but he was pain free in one hour and the lesions were gone in two days, completely gone. That's not possible in an 85 year old man that has shingles in his eye and on the top of his head. The frequency is specific. That frequency acts as if it changes not only membrane protein configuration and cell function electromagnetically, but it acts as if it disassembles the virus capsid, the top of the virus that holds the virus together. How does it do that? Well, it, we have to be specific when we treat is the inflammation from trauma or viruses. If it's from trauma, you reduce the inflammation. If it's from a virus, you have to kill or disassemble the virus. We change with frequency specific, we change the pattern by changing cell signaling. Mm, but how does this happen with just frequencies and microcurrent? The human body is, and it's nice, I don't have to tell this group this, you are a quantum biological system. What does that mean? Well, your large body follows the laws of Newtonian physics, right? You have mass, you have weight, you respond to gravity. If we drop you off a building, you accelerate at 32 feet per second per second until you hit the ground, right? So as a large body, you respond to Newtonian physics. But Newtonian physics falls apart on the molecular level. Doesn't work. It's embarrassing, but it doesn't work. So on the molecular level, what does that have to do with you? 
Well, your living tissue is made up of biochemicals. Okay. What are biochemicals made of? Well, molecules. What are molecules made of? Hmm. Atoms. What are atoms made of? Ugh. Subatomic particles. And molecules, atoms, and subatomic particles follow the laws of quantum physics. And they are all held together by electromagnetic bonds. The only reason that you are sitting in that chair, instead of dissolved as atoms into space, is the electromagnetic bonds that hold you together on a quantum level. And the thing about bonds is that every bond has a frequency at which it resonates. So we're going to put a pin in that. Cells are filled with a gel matrix and water lines the gel inside those cells and forms structures that act as a semiconductor. That one slide is a 30 minute lecture, so we're going to move on from there. But you accept as a given from biophysics that your entire body, because of the water that you drink, makes your body into one giant semiconductor. It's an electromagnetic system that looks solid, but the cells function as a semiconductor network that conveys current, charge, and information. So back to the resonance that happens with bonds. Resonance is the tendency of a system or a bond to oscillate, to vibrate at large amplitudes in response to some frequencies, but not others. At the resonant frequency, at the correct frequency, very small forces can produce very large amplitude vibrations. So soldiers marching in step can collapse a bridge. So have you ever noticed that when you watch a column of soldiers marching, when they get to a bridge, they break step? That's because they had unfortunate experiences in the 1800s with marching across bridges that then <coughs> fell apart. Resonance explains the frequency effects. When you see the demonstration where a singer breaks a lead crystal glass, that trick only works with a lead crystal glass that is 70% lead because there is a precise frequency that holds lead atoms together in a crystal matrix. This lead atom bond vibrates with the singer's note and the lead crystal simply comes apart because of the resonance. It is that powerful. And that, I think, is how we take apart viruses. So frequencies appear to change membrane protein configuration and cell function electromagnetically with a frequency specific frequency signal. Now, to achieve lasting effects, you have to change the stable state. You have water, and water is completely stable as ice, correct? As long as the surrounding milieu is zero degrees centigrade. Then you add energy to the system, and water is completely stable as a liquid, as long as the surrounding temperature is between 1 and 100 degrees centigrade. You add more energy to the system and water is completely stable as steam, as long as the surrounding environment is 100 degrees centigrade. It is the environment, right? The frequencies, the temperature changes the state of the water, the correct frequencies create instantaneous changes to change the state of the tissue, and those changes can be permanent as long as the patient's metabolism, attitude, body mechanics, nervous system support the change in state. You, you, all of you already, create a stable state with integrative medical strategies. You treat the infection with antibiotics and herbs or IV strategies. You repair the trauma with FSM or tincture of thyme or uh, herbs or Ayurvedic medicine or acupuncture. You repair, you repair the trauma with hyperbaric oxygen and exercise and homeopathics. 
to create a stable state for your energy system, you can support mental calm and maintain stress reduction with supplements, meditation, sometimes medication. If we can turn the vagus back on and quiet the stress centers, we can nudge, help, connect your system to your own higher consciousness and this information field. Stress, inflammation, and infection inhibit your connection to consciousness because it keeps you down here in the stress ah, response. When your system is worried about physical safety, infection, or threat, it interferes with these higher functions. When injury and inflammation is repaired, the stress center should quiet down, but because of centralization, central sensitization, sometimes they need help to quiet down. Sometimes when people try to meditate, it makes them more anxious because the silence was what was threatening when they were children, right? Frequency-specific microcurrent helps heal the injuries, reduces inflammation, is able to quiet the stress response, and we are able to turn on the vagus and turn down the stress centers in the brain to first put the tiger to sleep and then to help the system balance itself so that you can access your own higher states of consciousness and your connection to the information field and universal consciousness. So it's called frequency-specific microcurrent and it is a new tool that we hope will allow you to enhance your experience of consciousness and your access to the information field. I hope you join us for the course. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs>